Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session. Um, we're looking at other sessions today. Have been looking at how uh, are looking at how legal firms are um, delivering change right now. We want to look ahead five and or ten years and look at the long-term um, impact of current developments on business and operational services and what the, how they need to change in order to deliver. We want to do a bit of speculation, maybe a, even a little bit of provocation. Um, you could argue that the professions, particularly law, have been very protected from disruptive change in the past by their special expertise, professional regulations, and perhaps by the size of the sector, which, although it's very profitable, is small compared with um, you know, mass commercial markets. We also want to, uh, I think, recognise that partnerships do find it quite hard to plan for longer than a, a one-year cycle, or maybe, at best, the, the, the length of the managing partner's term. But things are changing. Um, technologists are turning their mind to law now. Artificial intelligence it seems to be in all the press at the moment. It's getting cheaper and smarter. Um, uh, Susan gave us some examples um, earlier, earlier on. Um, the Economist had an article just a couple of weeks ago saying that some software programs now regularly outperform legal experts in terms of predicting the out, um, outcome of patent dispute cases and also the Supreme Court. And uh, you may have seen Richard and Daniel Suskind have got a new book out, and they claim that the professions will change more in the next quarter of a century than they have in the previous three. So what we have here is an expert panel who will try to um, assess, evaluate a little bit about the potential long-term impact on the changes that we see, and we're focusing on three areas which affect business services. First, the value and impact of specialised non-legal skills in law firms. Then, radical approaches to process improvement and efficiency. And finally, of course, technology, artificial intelligence, digitization, etc. the impact of that. On our panel, we have Daniel Nagler, who uh, formerly was COO and is now a consultant with Berwyn Leighton Paisner. Alistair Mitchell, um, CEO and, and CFO at Home and Fenwick Willem. And Axel Kirsch, um, COO for Germany at, and Austria at Freshfields. And I'm Claire Singleton. I was until six weeks ago CEO at Taylor Wessing, um, and I'm now an independent consultant. So, turning to our first issue, um, Danielle, you're going to make some comments on this. I know you feel strongly that there is a huge value in business services um, bringing in new and, and, and bringing in and integrating new skills and moving beyond the back office. Would you like to comment on maybe what, how you think things will develop over the next few years? Sure. Well, I thought I might start by checking that everyone is still awake post-coffee break and actually gauging where people in the room are. So can I ask everyone to stand up to start with? Um, the question that I wanted to pose, we're looking at a period of five to ten years and what collectively we think will happen in relation to operational roles and the relationship between operations and legal businesses. And so what I want to do, starting at sort of three years out, I want to ask you to sit down at the point at which you think that the role that you currently have within your businesses will disappear or will, will, will cease to exist in a form which it exists today. I don't see a point in starting within three years because that might just sort of be a call to the headhunters. Um, <laughs> So starting at three years, four, five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, nine, ten. If you're still standing up, I'm really intrigued as to what you do. Would anyone like to? <laughs> Is any, any, any of the, sorry, you can sit down now. Any, anyone kind of got any comments of those who were still standing at the end as to why they feel that their role would persist? Pricing. Pricing. I think certainly my feeling is that we're in the middle of a kind of transformation of how business services relates to law firms. The term business support is sort of starting to wane, but still quite prevalent. And support suggests very much a kind of Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs type of relationship between business people and lawyers. And the reasons for it, I suppose, starting to erode, but I do think we're very much in transition at the moment, are that the nature of legal business is becoming so much more complex that law firms willingly or unwillingly, and there's a whole sort of spectrum out there um, within each firm and across firms, are having to recognize that 
they need to become much more sophisticated in terms of how they run their businesses if they are to engage effectively with clients who are themselves becoming much more sophisticated <laughs> businesses. It's, a sort of, it's very difficult to deal with someone who really doesn't get and doesn't operate in the same way as you. And similarly, if you're running a, a, a business whose revenues run into the hundreds of millions and spans the globe, you cannot operate as if you were a group of 10 partners sitting around who were all able to sit around a table. I think the way that I see it panning out is a shift from where, a substantial shift, probably in th within three to five years, from where we are now, where I think the role of pricing specialists, of project managers, of people who are looking at process efficiency in a variety of ways is very sort of hot and sexy now and has been for the last couple of years, to a world in which those things are the norm within law firms. Maybe they will still be done by specialists, specialists within the legal space or specialists who have come in from other businesses to law. Um, but other broader functions will become, in a way, more important, more important to sort of have a higher profile within law firms, particularly around areas like talent management. I think what we're seeing is a shift from the sort of support box into business services people moving into properly assisting in the leadership and running of legal businesses. And alongside that, some of those skills that possibly have sat only with non-lawyers actually being required and integrated into the legal skill set. Not every partner, clearly, but one's getting a kind of fusion. And partly because of that, some, I, my view is that some of the roles that are currently played by non-lawyers will be taken on by lawyers with an aptitude in those areas. And likewise, some of the things that have traditionally been done by lawyers in relation to the running of firms will get taken up by those who don't have legal qualifications but may be better placed to do it. I think sort of even five years ago, the idea of a non-lawyer going to meet a client to discuss a pitch or to discuss a relationship would have been unusual, possibly unheard of. Now, it's pretty, it would be pretty commonplace that a member of the business development team who is integrated with the lawyers would go with a partner. No one, no one would think twice about that. Likewise, the sort of the involvement of finance specialists or product managers within a pitch or within a kind of resourcing decision is becoming commonplace. Again, those are very substantial changes from where things were three or five years ago. And I think one can expect that that trend will continue and evolve. And indeed, many of the things that we do today will have passed by and we'll be on to the kind of next wave of dealing with the challenges within firms. Excellent. Excellent. Alistair, any comments on, on that? I, I just think, I mean, looking at um, the, the way we deliver services, it was really interesting that the, the previous session before the coffee break um, with, with the general counsel there, I mean, I, I would love to get those guys in front of some of the partners where, where I work, just, just for them to, to hear what GCs are, are, are actually saying, because you know, one of the things I keep hearing our guys saying is we can't chase the work down to the bottom. Um, you know, we, we've got to keep our, our, our price, you know, it's, it's, all, it's not about price. It's, it's about how efficiently we do the work. You know, you can make money out of any sort of legal service. You've just got to structure it right. And that's where I see we've got to look at radical process improvement. Eight or nine years ago, I was, I was in a meeting um, <clears throat> at my previous firm, and we were talking about outsourcing and process re-engineering and all that good stuff. And, you know, five years later, nothing had really happened, nothing had really changed, but I think it will now. Um, I, I do see a real acceleration, and clients are driving that agenda. Um, Robin, um, you know, who, who's working at AIG, we do a lot of insurance-based work. AIG is one of our clients, so I've got to be very careful what I say now. Um, I've got to be very nice to him. But, but, but by the same token, what they're looking for is, is innovation and a different way of dealing with this. We can't keep ducking this. We don't do that sort of work. We don't do the commoditized type of work. We need to get our heads out of the sand a little bit and actually face up to the fact we need to do all this work, but we need to structure it in the most efficient way possible. We're currently looking at certain ABS models um, because we think that that's the way forward to keep ourselves front and center 
with our clients, we have to do all the spectrum of work, not just the high-end work that we all, you know, the lawyers love and adore, but some of the more basic stuff. Um, and to do that, we've got to be much more efficient in the way we deliver it. We're looking at, um, we do a lot of small litigation type claims, trips, slips, that sort of thing. Um, and we're looking at, at software to help us deliver that much more efficiently. Um, and also using non-legal people to do the work. You know, you don't need lawyers to be doing a lot of this work, and that's where I see a change in, 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 in the model. Hitherto, lawyers have got to be involved. Even trainees are expensive. They're a really expensive resource for clients, and we've got to look at that. We've brought in a, a load of um, what we call team assistants now who are doing a lot of this inputting, commoditized-type work much more cheaply, much more cost-effectively. So I think we're going to have to continue looking at that, and, and business services, more admin support will, will help in that. Disaggregation was another area. I mean, not just breaking down transactions into different parts and getting different um, people to do that work, but, but just looking at generally who's best placed to do the work that we do. It shouldn't always be the lawyer, but, but front of mind in, in the lawyer's mind at the moment is a lawyer has to be involved but not in all parts of it. I think we need to be much more creative but in relation to that. But do you think lawyers will accept that? <clears throat> that almost what could be seen as a hollowing out of their role by taking specialist functions and putting them with other people? Axel, if you See, I'm, I'm bloody scared of the future. Um, and you know, our firm is a premium firm, and it's a very large firm. Um, until a short time ago, ago, we were the largest firm also by headcount in my market. Um, we're still by turnover, but someone else, you know, a lot more people, less turnover has ever taken us, which is right. Because you will probably always have these partnerships, small giving high-end advice, whether it ends up being local or a global model, I don't know. Um, but I do firmly believe um, that the, the true innovation has got to come from somewhere else. And that's probably the type of legal company, let's not call it a law firm, which does not have business services, does not have partners, and does not have matters or so on anymore. Right? Because it's not about delivering specific bits of advice, but it's about solving our clients, not even problems, but actually so, um, managing our clients' risks, as we said before, and enabling their business activity, whichever way you do it. And at that point in time, um, whether you are a qualified lawyer, whether you're a person running the artificial intelligence system, or whether the business services person ends up being irrelevant. So, or we might get firms where lawyers are the back office and uh, other functions are the leading, are leading the relationships. Um, and actually, that's, that's probably what you see. If you look at some of the alternative providers, um, the, the CEOs of these organizations are not necessarily lawyers. Um, so I'm, I'm very, I, I think there'll be great development, um, it'll be very exciting, um, but it's going to be very scary for quite a number of us. Technology. Technology is, is, is not just a thing that's out there, it's, it's really arriving now. Axel, maybe you could say, what, where do you think the most profound changes are going to come in technology in the legal sector? Um, Technology is clearly coming, so working its way up from the bottom. Right? And it's a bit like that classic innovation story about the um, miniature diggers, which everybody laughed at the beginning and said that's for the really small and stupid stuff. And um, suddenly one day you wake up and it's dug away all your business. So um, we, I see technological change is going to come. Um, we see it happening all around us. Suddenly you know, there's an artificial intelligence engine popping up there, doing real estate stuff really well. Um, a lot of stuff is actually not artificial intelligence. It's, it's, it's quite stupid what is out there, but it is so, even in its simplicity, adds great value, reduces complexity, and makes highly exp uh, expensive lawyers redundant. Um, so this change is happening. Siskin and so on, that's all right. Um, now the question is, is it happening inside the big law firms? And I see a few people managing it decently. I don't see anybody managing it really well in the big law firms. And I've been asking myself, why? There's so many smart people. Why are they not seeing it? And I think one of them is this sort of fear in a business services sort of distinction. If, if you are a 
partner and decision making is amongst partners. What you value is you know, the things that you've done well, and, and it's difficult just to see and make that change. Um, there's something around um, the need for capital in these cases. Uh, you know, a bunch of us in this room will be we've been talking to IBM and how much would it take to get Watson to work for the legal sector with them, and no one has wanted to put in that kind of money, right? Because how are you going to distribute it amongst the partnership and all that? And then also the way we make decisions in law firms is um, in many tends to be just really bad, you know. Um, <laughs> You need to get so many people involved, and then you know, the, perhaps the idea that you have in, on the IT side, you talk to the partner who then tells you what he thinks the client would like about this, and um, then 10 different partners have 10 different opinions about this, um, and then either nothing happens, or you spend a year or two building something which fulfills all these requirements, and then you go and show a client and actually it's not what they need. Um, I've had that kind of experience recently, um, internally about something, and um, I think after three months we're still building the business case to start thinking about the solution. And I met an alternative provider yesterday who said, I get what you want, I'm meeting my programmers tomorrow, it's a week's work, 5,000 euros. So is this change going to happen? Yes. There will be people out there putting the 5,000 euros and getting this done. And I am not sure that this change is going to happen within the law firms. Well, we saw in our question earlier on this morning, didn't we, which is the most prized business services function? I think I, think I remember IT came, came at the Boston. bottom. Mm. Danielle, have you got thinking about <coughs> technology and the impact? I'm, sort of, I'm struck by what you say in, in, in a couple of, couple of regards. I think that traditionally law has been a business of intellect and what we're sort of struggling with is a recognition within partnerships, and as you, as you say, Axel, within people who have grown up with that being what they went into and what they felt valued for, of a recognition that now it's moving towards being a much, much broader business that genuinely delivers a service. And you mentioned the sort of lawyers being the back office, and there was a sort of slight snigger went round the room. But actually, that sort of very technical, non-client-facing lawyer is already shifting, I would say, towards the back of the offices. Because that ability to unpick a particularly thorny point is, is still valuable and still possibly difficult to replicate through a machine or through a non-lawyer, but it's not on the whole what clients want from their law firms. What they want, as we sort of heard earlier in a variety of ways, is a service that meets their business needs and engages with them commercially and can sort of span the range. And you may be right that that change doesn't come from law firms themselves, but frankly, the law firms that don't manage somehow to navigate that shift in what their the, the buyers of their services want, in my view, sort of won't be in business. And in order to do that, they absolutely need to engage with how you make substantial capital investments to transform a business and also how you take decisions in a timely fashion. It sort of reminds me, I don't, I don't know who here is familiar with Mad Men Series 7 and the kind of the arrival of the monster computer that kind of takes over the entire creative lounge within the advertising agency. Computers now are obviously smaller, but there is still that sort of sense of, uh, I have of a very, very live shift from one kind of business which was sort of clubby, collegiate, quite easygoing, to a much more rigorous and commercial type of world. And while I think there are, there are of course, lawyers who can navigate that and actually have a set of people skills and commercial skills that actually make them very, very successful within this environment, I don't, I don't think anyone would suggest that every lawyer needs to be a great technologist in order to confront the challenges of the future. Equally, there are those who are very, very uncomfortable with that world. And certainly what I see is their role within the law firms and within decision-making in the law firms starting to reduce. It may not do so quickly enough. So, Alistair, there's some of us, like myself, are neither technologists nor lawyers. Do you think people like us and maybe other, others in the room, do you think we have a future in, in legal? I, th I think so for now. Um, 
for how much longer, who knows. But I, I, I do think it, the profession will need, or well, the profession, that's probably the wrong term, the business, in a sense, will need people to guide it through the next few years because I don't think lawyers are best positioned to set up the new businesses or the new structures mm -hmm. that we're going to need um, to deliver on client expectations. Um, I think you're going to have to have professionals who understand the different types of business. I, I still think there's a big role for lawyers. You know, there'll still be the bet the company <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there's going to be the, the, the cerebral advice around, you know, investments and taxation and all those good things that will always require that, that specialist advice. But there's going to be other bits of the business that don't quite require that level of technical expertise and need to be managed in a different way. And I think that's the problem that we face is that, that lawyers can't give that bit up at the moment. I think they get nervous. I, th I see a number of firms doing this really well. Um, and uh, so I, I'm not quite as gloomy as I, as I said before, because I do <laughs> think there's a way out. And that's, where I think, where, where people of, of your role and profile come in. Um, and that is that you need to create some space in which you're allowed to do the things which you normally you're not allowed to do as a lawyer. Yeah? You need to be open with the outside, i.e. not try and build these things yourselves, but bring the solutions in yeah. and share stuff. Um, you, need to be, you need to fail. Right? I mean, innovation only works if you are relentless at failing, coming up with new ideas and running them against the wall. Um, that feels really difficult for a lawyer. I mean, sort of, you know, failed projects don't exist, just ones which go on dying forever. So um, and some firms are doing this really well, setting up an innovation board, creating sort of something a bit off to the side. You still need to have a link in with clients and perhaps more with clients than with the business. Um, but for me, that's the way in which we can um, sort of just inoculate ourselves with change. Partnerships are, as we, those of us who work there know, they're quite unique and uh, interesting organisations. Do you think the sector is going to be able to attract and use the people with the skills that it needs in, the, in this sort of medium-term period between where we are now and where we might be in 10 years' time? Danielle, have you got a view on that? I think it's tricky. I, I mean, I think there is a much greater openness to bringing in people from outside the sector and to seeking to deploy them, and I suppose recognising that if the legal sector is to advance, there are maybe things that it can take from elsewhere. On the other hand, once those people come in, I think it's an open question as to whether firms and lawyers know how to treat those people and to get the best out of them, because this sense of kind of fierna, non-fierna, one sort of subservient to the other, is, is quite prevalent still, not not everywhere but it's it's sort of fairly mainstream and there is a risk that good people who come in from outside the sector take a look at the partnership structure take a look at the decision making structure take a look at the sort of all the differences that we're familiar with between a regular corporate and how things happen there and how things happen in a partnership and go it's just too difficult to operate in this environment I'm sort of getting out um, I think, therefore, that in a way, law firms need to think very hard about how they treat and work with their business services professionals if they are to get the best out of them and to use them to move forward. Um, and also, they sort of need to move, they need to understand something about value that I'm not sure is prevalent. When our main unit is the chargeable hour, and if you like, an individual's contribution to the business is measured by how many chargeable hours they have done and what the financial value of those chargeable hours is done, and is, forget profit for a moment, this is just revenues, then clearly those within the business, lawyers or non-lawyers, who don't do chargeable hours but perhaps make contributions to bringing in clients or developing clients or developing the business or saving money or opening up new opportunities, somehow their value is less than the person who went out and billed £3 million last year. And in a way, we sort of need those metrics to shift and a greater understanding of what constitutes value for the business and value for the client to take hold. I think it's shifting, but, but slowly, for a proper appreciation and valuation of people whose role is not 
doing legal hours to take hold. We haven't talked a lot about outsourcing in this conversation here. We've talked about bringing in different skills, um, integrating them more. What are the views, Alistair, maybe would like comment a bit on outsourcing, which was very much a, a, a big issue two or three years ago. A lot of talk about outsourcing um, business services and other functions out of law, law firms. My experience of it is that it doesn't work um, in, in law firms particularly because they're very small, uh, usually highly fragmented. Um, and if you have any sort of international uh, element to your business, everybody has a different process in every jurisdiction, which makes it very difficult to outsource processes properly. Um, we, we found it incredibly difficult when we were doing it um, to make any significant savings, but we thought, we thought it was the right thing to do. Mm. So that's why we did it. Um, in hindsight, it was a mistake, and I, you know, it subsequently it's been brought back. Um, structured in a different way, you can still structure these things in a much more efficient way. But pure outsourcing, I don't think works in, in a law firm environment. I'll slightly object on this one. Um, How dare I, you? Yeah. <laughs> Never did that before. Um, <laughs> no. We, we're starting to turn around the way we think about what we do in all the business service functions. And it's less about, you know... Joe does this and Jane does that, but overall you deliver a specific service. Yep. Um, so you deliver an outcome. Um, and while what I've seen is when you do sort of, I think, whole function outsourcing or just basically you just buy in bodies, right? Mm. It doesn't make a big difference. But actually when you take the service you deliver, you, you, so you standardize it and then um, you turn it into something where you only have a transactional interaction with someone externally, um, then you can outsource that very well. Okay. Um, and it's, so we, you know, in, in this week for, for our finance function, we've sort of done the bit that all our bills go to an offside provider and the, the first time we see bills coming to us is when they land on the, on the person's desk who's ordered them inside a finance system and he clicks, yes, this is okay, we will pay it. So. I, I'm not buying in bodies, but I'm actually taking a bit of stuff that we used to do and shift it to the outside. And um, doing that kind of thing um, upgrades the quality of work that you, you keep. Yes. And um, for me, I've, uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last few years looking at sort of the, the, you know, how happy are the business service functions that we run. And, and actually, um, if you pick up all the issues that you talked about, mm -hmm. and actually are really able to say, you know, this is the goal of the business, this is how specifically you're contributing to it, make people feel as if they're part of delivering the front-end service, yep. um, showing the value they provide to other parts of the business, and making sure that there's a value proposition to them, um, you can massively make that change. So, um, that means if you treat your 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 talent, the way they deserve to be, and don't treat them just as a body you buy in, yep. as an outsourcing. Um, I think we will be able to attract the top talent. And, and the business recognizes that. I mean, I, I've been in this business for some time, but I remember the time when you know, there was real consternation if you hired anybody in business services who would be paid more than a junior lawyer. Right? So, and even if it's an IT expert or, or whatever. But um, those days are well and truly gone um, because that expertise is now recognized. Um, I, I don't know whether we'll get to the point where a business services person is paid more than the most senior partner. Perhaps in your model, yes. Um, but surely we have this evolution, and, and I think we're on a good track. Good. I think picking up on what you were saying about sort of outsourcing and processes, We've had a lot of focus over the last couple of years on process efficiency in terms of how legal work is delivered. Actually, the kind of business services functions within law firms, whether outsourced or not, have been very sort of haphazard, bespoke, lots and lots and lots of exceptions. As a, as a sort of an international office has opened up there, that's had its own way of doing things. And in a way, the kind of the great... Saving, and I suppose the potential win from hiring good business services people is to take the way that law firms run themselves and apply those same principles of process efficiency to them, which may result in 
decisions to outsource parts of them, but equally can save a huge amount, which then contributes to the bottom line in terms of both stress within the system, time and money spent on the way that these increasingly complex businesses run themselves. Um, we thought we'd finish with just as, as a bit of fun with a, a, a question to the audience. We thought we would take some of the trends that we've been speaking about to their potential um, ultimate conclusion and ask what we think the typical top 100 law firm is going to look like in, a, in 10 years' time. So, I think on your little thing. So, do you think that we'll have potentially more specialists and technologists and lawyers? Maybe we'll have a small legal core, but with lots of things outsourced. Um, we, we could have the optimistic option that um, law firms maybe will have um, some uh, commoditization, but they'll grow and they'll take on new services. Or do you think that actually all this is a bit of nonsense and will be much the same as today? So if you can vote, we'd be very grateful. <coughs> all right. Can we have the results? I'm sure it will change over... Well, the optim optimists win, then. <laughs> we think that a lot of partnerships will adapt and survive. Oh. You can still vote. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.